Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys as usual, so I thought I'd take a few minutes and answer some of the more recent boa related questions asked by the viewers of this channel. So hopefully if you've been wondering about some of these topics, this will be an informative video to watch. And of course I thought I'd get out some of the boas I enjoy handling the most, like this Branchia Columbia boa. This is a 2020 female. Definitely one of my favorite boas to handle. Why well, handle the more stressed out boas in a video like this anyway? Anyway, let's get to the questions. So the first question is, I have a true red tail boa and want to make sure I'm giving her optimal care. Does she need to breed and experience sex to be healthy? So the short answer to this question is no, you don't need to breed your boa for it to be healthy. And I've seen this a lot, especially with people that keep dogs and cats, where they have this idea that the dog or cat needs to breed and have sex with other dogs and cats in order for it to be healthy. And it's really completely not true. And unfortunately, with the overpopulation of dogs and cats, it's really uh, unethical to allow them to breed uncontrollably. Um, in addition for boas, the life expectancy will actually decrease if you breed your boa, especially for females, because there are a number of problems that can go wrong when you breed your female boa, which can lead in worst case scenario to the death of the boa, including things like retained slugs or retained embryos. Uh, you know, sometimes the delivery goes wrong and the female unfortunately doesn't make it. Um, even if your boa is bred successfully, there's a negative correlation between life expectancy and number of litters born. So the more that you breed a boa in general, the less its life expectancy is. Because the boas, especially the females, have to put an awful lot into producing the young. It's an awful lot of energy and a lot of stress on their system to go through the whole reproduction process. Especially since they're live bearers and they have to retain the babies inside of them rather than just laying eggs and you know going on with their life. So, and I would say the other thing to consider is you absolutely don't want to be breeding your boa unless you've really thought it out and you have a plan for all the babies and you know what you're doing. So please don't enter into breeding boas lightly. Uh, if you have a pet boa, it's going to be 100% fine and healthy without being bred. Okay, the next question. My new baby boa spends all the time buried in substrate. Is this normal? So the short answer is yes, this is normal. Boas like to hide and the substrate can provide a convenient hiding place, especially if it's something like a, uh, like a wood chip type sub substrate like cocoa husk or cocoa coir. And I often see my boas burying themselves in the substrate. So it might be frustrating because you can't see your boa and it's you know, always buried in the substrate. I would suggest if this is an issue, to put more hiding places in your boa's enclosure. Give the boa plenty of cork bark hides and you know plastic boxes or anything that you can turn into a substrate into a uh, hiding place. Even like old boxes, cardboard boxes, if you replace them when they get soiled. But you just want to give your boa plenty of hiding places so he or she doesn't feel the need to always be hiding in the substrate. Okay, so the next question. What do you think of Dominican uh, red mountain boas? I don't see any videos from you, or in general, I don't see a lot of videos on YouTube. Are there any issues with this type of boa? So the Dominican red mountain boas are really interesting species in the genus Epicrates, along with the Brazilian rainbow boas. And I've often admired them. I, you know, when I've seen pictures of them online, they're very beautiful looking animals. Um, you know, the whole genus Epicrates is a really, uh, looks like a really great genus to work with. So as far as I know, there aren't any issues with them per se. You know, my, the only issue I have is I only have space and bandwidth for basically one type of uh, animal that I work with. And that of course is the boa constrictor complex. And this was formerly one species boa constrictor with something like eight to 10 different subspecies. And it's recently been reclassified into three species, boa constrictor, boa imperator, and boa uh, sigma. So these are the only animals I work with. I just find that I'd rather put my energy into, you know, a very uh, focused group of animals that I can do really, really well and work with very, um, 
very well rather than to try to spread my energy among lots of different taxons of reptile. Then I'd grab another boa to share with you guys and this is a Venezuelan red tail. So this girl is about five years old just reaching sexual maturity. She's from the Rio Bravo bloodline bred by my friend Mike Lucchese. And a real nice example of these uh, relatively rare true red tail boas. I just love the yellowish golden color and the you know clean overall appearance as well as the smaller size than most other red tails. Uh, she's probably as I mentioned she's sexually mature. I don't not sure if I'm going to breed her this coming year. I'll just have to see. I'm making my plans for the 2023 breeding season right now. This next question is kind of related to the last question I was discussing where I told you I just keep the boa constrictor group and the question is what do you keep other than boas? And in fact I do have one reptile that's not in the boa constrictor group and it's my Indian python. And I've shown this uh, animal in several videos. I don't show him in too many videos. He's actually my largest snake so he's a little bit hard to work with given his size. Maybe I'll do some videos in the near future on him. But he's a very impressive animal and I've had this animal for about 15 years now. Got him actually in a trade uh, with some of my early produced boa constrictors. So he's my only non boa constrictor reptile. And then I have you know the standard domestic pets. A lot of people keep dogs and cats um, and actually I spent a lot of time caring for my dogs walking them and you know doing all the things that you need to do to keep a dog as a pet. Okay, next question. Have you ever considered crossing a Suriname red tail with a Peruvian red tail or know anyone who has? So my breeding focuses on locality specific animals. And so I always want to keep the animals that descend from a known origin separate from those from a different origin. And in the case of Suriname red tails and Peruvian red tails, they're considerably different. Although they are classified as the same subspecies, the appearance is quite different. The behaviors are quite different. So there is highly likely to be underlying biological differences between the two forms, even though they are considered the same subspecies. So I always want to keep them separate. Uh, in general, locality boa collectors are really fastidious about maintaining pure boas. They don't want to buy or obtain a crossbred animal, an animal from say a Suriname boa cross with a Peruvian boa or a Peruvian boa cross with a Venezuelan boa because these animals do have distinct behaviors and appearances even though they're the same subspecies. When it comes to certain other localities it gets a little bit more murky. For example the Guiana and the Suriname true red tails. So these animals uh, given that they're the same subspecies and given that their range in the wild intermingles and there's really no geographical barriers that separates the Suriname boas from mixing with the Guiana boas and also given that it's virtually impossible to tell uh, if an animal came from Suriname or Guiana based on appearance I would say it's a little bit more murky. Uh, most locality breeders and collectors do maintain separate Guiana and Suriname populations myself included. In fact I only have one pair of Guianas which I got because they look to me anywhere way considerably different from my Suriname boa so I keep them as a separate uh, you know breeding project. But many animals sold as Guiana boas are really indistinguishable from Suriname boas. I've seen instances where somebody sold a boa which had been described as a Guiana boa as a Suriname boa. And I've also heard that in the wild when they were collected it was pretty common for people to collect boas in one country Suriname and then ship them out of Guiana because it might have been illegal to ship animals out of Suriname at that time point. So with the case of Guianas and Surinams it's definitely a little bit more murky. But to answer the question, no, I've never bred a Suriname and a Peruvian. I don't know anyone who has, and I would highly recommend that you don't do such a cross. Thought I'd get out this really popular boa here on the Brian Boas YouTube channel, which is, of course, my anerythristic Paraguana Peninsula male. And unfortunately, this guy didn't breed for me this year, but better luck next year. We'll just have to see. So to continue the questions, the next question that I received is, I've noticed that you always hold your boas in your hands, sometimes at arm's length, rather than draping them around your uh, shoulders or 
close to your face. Is this based on a bad experience? So the short answer, no, I haven't had a bad experience with a boa handling them you know, around my shoulders or close to my face. However, I do this for several reasons. The first reason is that it allows the viewers to get a much better view of the whole animal if I hold the animal out rather than have them back around my shoulders. And I just think I want this channel to be about these animals, so I want the focus to be on them rather than on me. And by holding them out, I think you get a better experience of them that way. The other thing is that yes, it. You know, anytime you put a snake close to your face, it could theoretically bite your face. And I've never been bitten in the face. It's probably unlikely, but it's definitely a possibility. Um, and you really have to be careful holding snakes. So this particular animal I know is calm and docile, and this animal is highly, highly unlikely to bite me. So I wouldn't feel uncomfortable putting him around my shoulders or closer to my face. But I have other animals where I really can't say that. And you know, typically those are hold even farther away. Um, the other re reason is I wanna give people a good, uh, I wanna act as a good role model. And in general, it's not the best idea to put many types of large snake around your neck. Okay, especially any snake l larger than around six feet or so. There's a possibility if it shifts its weight that it can cut off your, uh, you know, a vein in your neck. Um, in some cases, it can result in unconsciousness. And I've seen reports where people have supposedly gotten injured when the snake was just around them and it was, you know, shifting its weight. And of course, they blame the snake. The snake is not acting in an aggressive way. It's just kind of holding on. It's not trying to hurt the person. But unfortunately, that happens. So in general, it's really not a good idea to put a large snake around your neck and drape it that way. Okay, so our next question. The cost of feeder rodents at shows is super high lately. Can you recommend an affordable rodent supplier? Unfortunately, I can't, and the cost of rodents has skyrocketed in the last year or two. It's just gotten crazy lately. Um, you know, the, the types, the price of rodents, well, my monthly rodent bill is now well over $800. Just keeps going up. You know, a lot of this has to do with the same reasons that everything else is going up. The price of fuel and gasoline and oil has gone way up. Inflation has gone through the roof. The cost of all the materials that it takes to breed the rodents has gone up. The cost of shipping the rodents has gone up. So this is just something that we have to deal with. You know, when we have eight, nine, 10% inflation, you know, that's gonna happen. You know, and the government claims that it's, you know, 8.2% or whatever the latest figure is. If you've been to the grocery store in the last year, you know damn well, most products have gone up a lot more than eight or 9%. So it's pretty scary. I don't think that this is gonna change anytime soon. And the prices are definitely not gonna go down. So even if we get to 0% inflation, we still got these high prices. They're just unfortunately gonna continue to go up. So unfortunately, the rodent companies have to do what everyone else has to do, increase the prices in order to stay in business. And that's just a reality of keeping and breeding snakes these days, you gotta pay more money for the rodents, which of course leads to higher prices for the snakes. So it's inflation is bad, I think, for everybody. I don't think there's any real winners here. One thing I would recommend is you may want to reevaluate if you're buying your rodents from a supplier, it might make more sense now for you to breed them yourselves. And in the past, when rodents were less expensive, it didn't make quite as much sense. But with the prices continuing to go up and up and up, it might be better to breed your own. And I'm kind of doing this cost analysis right now to see if I should start to breed some rats. As you may know, I breed just a few mice, so I have baby mice to feed to my baby boas. But it might make sense for me to breed a few rats just so that I can get some more cost-effective rodents rather than paying these sky-high prices. But you know, since I have a limited amount of space and bandwidth, and you know, my wife is gonna flip out if I bring any more animals into the house, this might not work out for me. It might not be a good idea. The next question is kind of related and it concerns shipping costs. The question is, I've reviewed your terms of sale and I'm fine with everything, but the $90 shipping cost seems quite high. How did you arrive at that number? Well, unfortunately, FedEx 
shipping labels have gone up quite considerably in the last year or two. And I use Reptiles Express, which is a service which actually does give me somewhat of a discount. Even with that, it typically runs about 90 to $95 for a FedEx priority label for one of my BOA packages. So that's what I have to pay for the label. It's a, supposedly with a discount because the price without the Reptiles uh, Express discount is typically around $120, $130, which is pretty sky high. But again, when we're talking about gasoline, that's well over $4 a gallon and all the other costs, unfortunately, this is what FedEx has to do to stay in business. I remember just a few years ago, shipping prices were somewhere in the $40 to $50 range for the same shipment. And I'm very concerned about this trend because, you know, at some point the shipping prices might get so exorbitant that a lot of people might not be able to have BOAs just because they can't afford to ship them. So unfortunately, this is just something that we have to contend with. It's possible the shipping prices might go down somewhat because the price of gas has started to go down somewhat. But unfortunately, it always seems like when the prices of raw materials finally start to go down, that the prices of the other things tend to stay up. So it's a lot longer for the prices to go back down. So we'll just have to see. But basically I charge my shipping based on what it costs for the FedEx uh, label. I don't charge for the boxes. I have to buy shipping boxes with styrofoam lining. I have to buy other shipping supplies like heat packs and packing tape, things like that. So I you know, foot the bill for that. And then I have to put the packages in my car and drive about half an hour each way to get to the FedEx ship center near me. So that's more cost in terms of the fuel, which I don't pass on to. I just charge for the shipping label. The other part of the question was they asked about why shipping is so expensive, shipping from California to Arizona, when in the past they haven't had to pay as much to ship all the way to Florida or you know, a package from Florida to Arizona. And the reason for this is because of the FedEx hub system. Basically, almost all the packages go from where you ship them to the central hub in Memphis, Tennessee, and then they're shipped to their final destination. So sometimes when I ship a package to like Colorado, for example, it doesn't make sense that it would go all the way to Memphis and then back uh, west to Colorado, but this is how FedEx works. They ship everything to their central hub in Memphis, Tennessee, and then it's on to their final destination. The exception is certain local shipments within California don't ship to the central hub, but most of the shipments do. So it basically ends up costing the same uh, regardless of where someone is in the country. And then the other thing, I charge a, a flat fee. I don't figure out the exact amount. And the exact amount of these labels lately is anywhere from like $85 to around $95. And the reason is because it varies week to week, day to day. You know, in some cases it's a little bit more, a little bit less depending on your address. But um, I don't find this out until I actually get the label. So I don't know exactly how much it's gonna be. So I basically just charge a flat fee. Then I'd grab this Holdback 2018 female Suriname. So this girl is starting to show her adult musculature. Got this nice square muscular shape and just a nice looking boa. Still probably two or three years away from breeding. We'll just have to see, but you know, growing up quite nicely. So the next question that I have in my list of questions is uh, how many holes do you drill in a tub to maintain the proper humidity? And there's not a simple answer to this because there's so many variables involved. Typically, I will put holes in the tubs in my racks, and I'll just show you an example. These are the six quart sterilites that I use for some of my smaller baby dwarf boas, for example. And I typically will not drill, but I melt with a soldering iron, uh, a four by four grid on four, uh, two sides of the enclosure. You can see there's four of these four by four grids. And that for me has worked quite well. However, the actual answer is gonna vary depending on the ambient humidity in your uh, facility, the amount of uh, clearance between the top of the tub and the rack, you know, does it let any air in, the substrate that you're using, and the type of BOA. So you're gonna have to empirically figure out how many holes to drill 
uh, to get to the right amount. You know, if it's that if it's too humid or not humid enough, you might need to change the number of holes. Okay, next question. I'm not planning on breeding, but should I cool my qual key boa slightly and stop feeding over the winter? Well, if you've followed any of my videos about breeding, you know that I do a slight cooling in the winter to induce breeding. Typically, I drop the temperatures at night to about 75 degrees for about two months or so. And I do this with animals that aren't gonna breed also, with the exception of my, uh, my, year, my baby boas born that year. So the baby boas that are born that year, under a year old, I just maintain the regular temperatures. But then starting that their second winter, I do drop the temperatures. Um, uh, with the sub-adult animals, I don't drop it as long as I do for the adults who are gonna be bred. So the adults who are gonna be bred, I usually keep the cycling up for about two months or so. With the younger boas, it's usually about a month. And it doesn't have to be exact, I kinda of vary it every year. So what I would say is that you don't have to drop the temperatures for a boa that's not gonna be bred. Um, but it's sometimes it's a good idea to do this anyway. And the reason being is it helps your boa to maintain the proper weight. And so often boas will feed quite ravenously during the summer months and into the fall. And then giving them a break from feeding over the winter is often a way that they can lose a little bit of weight and get back down to their ideal um, you know, body shape. And boas are designed by evolution to go through fasting periods in the wild. So it's not uncommon for a boa to gorge itself when food is available, but then to have relatively long periods with not much food available. And they're equipped to fast, you know, for a month or two, no problem. So it may well be a good idea to fast your boa, even if you're not gonna breed it, uh, to maintain the proper body condition. Okay, so one more question for today's video. Between the Cocker Key and Hog Island Boa, which is the best for a beginner? Okay, so both the Cocker Key and the Hog Island Boa are fine uh, types of boas for beginners to keep. They're relatively simple. They don't get that large. They're not uh, overly aggressive, enjoyable to handle. So I would recommend either of these forms of boa for a beginner if you're looking for an animal that doesn't get that big and is you know, beautiful to look at. There's not really a clear winner so it comes down to personal preference, which do you prefer the appearance of, the crawl key or the hog island. Uh, the crawl key is a little bit smaller as adults than the hog island, but not that much so. They're both relatively small forms of boa. They both have a lot to recommend them for someone who's a beginner, who's done their homework and knows how to properly care for such a boa. It also might come down to availability. Uh, in the last few years, both hog island boas and crawl key boas have been relatively difficult to find. So you might just have to uh, acquire the boa that's available uh, near you in the time frame that you want to get the boa. Okay, so I hope this question answer session was somewhat helpful. And maybe some of these topics are things that you've been wondering about. Please keep the questions coming and I'll do videos like this in the future. Uh, as always, shoot me any questions or comments you might have. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.